Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. The hair is so lovely. Hey, this is Brent from Shine Down. You're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stain, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Food Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the Band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. You're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to, you have the privilege of listening to Mistress Carrie. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Hey, it's Mistress Carrie, reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 198 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. And before we get to this week's guest, Keith Wallen from Breaking Benjamin, I want to remind you that you can find all the details about my weekly video show, Cocktails in the War Room, online at mistresscarrie.com. Cocktails in the War Room now streams live on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. And while you're on the website, you can also find every episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast, the concert calendar, and you can shop in the online Mistress Carrie store. Get all of the details on that and so much more at mistresscarry.com. Keith Wallen is the guitarist from Breaking Benjamin and an accomplished solo artist who's got his brand new album coming out called Infinity Now on May 3rd. He's also headed out on a solo tour before Breaking Benjamin hits the road with Stained this fall. You can see Keith Wallen in New England on July 21st at the Webster Theater in Hartford, Connecticut, and on July 22nd at the Paradise Rock Club in Boston. Stained and Breaking Benjamin, along with Daughtry and Lakeside, will be at the Bank of New Hampshire Pavilion in Guilford, New Hampshire on September 18th. Tickets for all of those shows are on sale now, and you'll find the links to buy tickets in the show notes of this episode. I had a chance to sit down with Keith Wallen to talk about the upcoming new solo album, Infinity Now. We talked about his home studio and pet cat, all of the time he's going to be spending on the road this year, his love of the Rolling Stones and Brian Head Welch from Korn. We also talked about his guitar heroes like Jerry Cantrell from Alice in Chains and Eddie Van Halen, his love of golf, the massive festivals he'll be playing this summer, and so much more. So excited to have Keith Wallen on the show this week, so... Allow me to introduce you to Keith Wallen from Breaking Benjamin. Mr. Keith Wallen, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I am good. Um, I always ask first thing as soon as I talk to the bands, where are you? Because most of the time you guys don't even know. <laughs> That's true. Most times we don't even know what day it is. Exactly. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I'm in, uh, I'm in East Tennessee and uh, yeah, it's kind of, uh, kind of a rainy day today. So it's, uh, it's perfect. Perfect to talk to you. Wait, are you home right now? I am. Yeah, I'm, uh, this is my basement. I always love getting a chance to look at like the studios and workspaces of all of the musicians that I talk to. You got a nice little setup down there in the basement. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you know, we we decided that uh, you know we wanted to leave this awful gaudy pipe uh, <laughs> running through my my ceiling. Uh, but uh, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, you know, it's. Uh, it's a good it's a good place to kind of work on music and stuff whenever I'm not on tour and um, it's kind of separate from everything else going on in the house and um, yeah nice and quiet yeah you have to have that quiet space this is MCHQ it's the same thing it's like you've got to have that space with the with the soundproofing that you can just escape the world oh yeah for sure for sure uh, you know there's an there's the occasional uh, I'll hear the cat running run across the floor upstairs a little bit but you know uh, that's it comes with the territory <laughs> i had to install a bed for my pug and she's actually snoring like right down there on the floor right now because heaven forbid she not be allowed into the studio oh of course yeah they're very particular our, our animals are very particular about where they can and can't go uh and you know and, and 
coincidentally, it's usually where we are, right where we are. So <laughs> I always ask artists about their pets and where they got the names. And I call it the geezer question because I talked to geezer Butler and he told me that he had 13 cats and five dogs. And when I asked him, how do you come up with all of those names? He said, my wife, Gloria, and I named them all after gangster rappers. I love it. And I was like, <laughs> from then on, I'm asking every artist where they get their pets names. So if you think it's a ridiculous question, blame geezer. I love it. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, my uh, my cat is named Theo. Um, Theodore when he's in trouble. Yeah, Theodore, <laughs> Theodore Bear Wallen. And then that way we can call him Teddy Bear if we want. It's always that thing when your mom uses your full name, you know you're effed. Oh, yeah. You're like, oh, oh yeah. man, I really stepped in it now. Mom's using the <laughs> full birth certificate name. Definitely. It definitely gets your attention. That's for sure. I am surprised that you're home because your schedule this year is... Um, Hectic? Would that be a good word to describe what 2024 is going to look like for you? Definitely. That's very accurate. Um, yeah, hectic, busy. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely going to be one. It's going to be one for, uh, <laughs> it's going to be a definitely a, a memorable year for, for my career. Uh, but, you know, I, I love it. I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, between the Breaking Benjamin tours and the solo tours that I've been announcing, I just announced uh one yesterday i announced a, a, another tour last week um it's gonna be busy but uh you know I, I i say this to everybody i mean i couldn't be more grateful to have a career number one and and just be able to to do this and play shows and get out there and tour um uh, i live for this shit. i really do i live for it i mean it's it's a dream come true it's it's a lot of work but uh you know, I, I know, I know one day I also say this all the time. I know one day I'm going to, I'm going to be too old to get in a van or get in a tour bus. And, and like, you know, my, I won't be able to play guitar. My hands will be all arthritic and I won't be able to play guitar. I won't be able to sing like I can now. And, and I, I want to look back and be like, you know what, while I was able to do it, I gave it my all. And I just, I left it all, I left it all on the field. So, uh, you so, say yeah. that, but at the end of May, the Rolling Stones are playing at Gillette Stadium, and Keith Richards is yeah. 80 and still plays. So I don't know why you think you're going to get to a point. <laughs> if Keith Richards can do it, so can you. That's true. Well, see, I haven't done as much drugs as him, so he's, <laughs> he's, he's kind of like halfway embalmed anyway, I think. So, uh, no, I, 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 I could not respect the hustle enough. Uh, that's the goal. That's really the goal uh, is to be able to be out there doing it when you're 80. I mean, it's mind blowing. Um, Paul McCartney I too. Mean, same thing. Like, yeah, yeah. Just being alive and making it to 80. I think that's a goal in itself for me. Anyway, I've, <laughs> I don't know. I've smoked a lot of cigarettes in my life, so hopefully I can make it that long. But uh, I don't smoke anymore, by the way. But yeah, back in back in the day, it definitely puffed on a heater or two. I quit. But, uh, I, I used to smoke as well years and years ago, like when I was in high school and college. Yep. And Ozzy said in a recent podcast episode that of everything he's ever done, cigarettes was the hardest to quit. I, I 100, 100% believe that. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, it's funny back, back then, you know, high school, college, that was like the thing to do. I mean, everybody smoked. I mean, you know, it, it's what's crazy to me now is, you know, I'm kind of dating myself a little bit, but I remember back in the 80s when I was a kid, you know, you'd go on trains and planes and they're just smoking in the train, smoking in the plane. You, know? you see it I'm in like, old movies all the time and yeah. kids look at that and they're like, that would never happen. It's like, that's how it used to be. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's funny to think how like there'd be a smoking section and a non-smoking section in a plane and like you're in a plane. <laughs> <laughs> We're all breathing. <laughs> My mom used to send me to the store on my bicycle when I was a little kid with two bucks to buy cigarettes for her and I yep. could buy candy with the rest. And I always used to buy the candy cigarettes that had the bubble gum <laughs> with the powdered sugar so that I could yeah. look cool like my mom smoking. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. I remember, I remember in college, uh, 
there was like this little store in the in the dorm that I lived at, and and there was like two dollars and ten cents for a pack of Marlboro Lights, and I remember scrounging up two dollars and and a dime, and I'd go in there and I'd be like, here we go. And then you know, now it's like I don't even know how much cigarettes are. It's like twenty bucks, seventeen <laughs> bucks a pack. So it's like, thank God I quit. I'd be broke by now. They want bodily fluids at this point. You just got to go in there and yeah. plug your body in there, and they just take what they need. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What did you study when you were in school? Uh, so I I was never a big math person at all. So I, I decided pretty early on, I'm like, all right, well, what's what's the opposite of, of numbers? Letters. So I, I figured let's let's do an English degree, see if I can at least, you know, I can at least, you know, finagle my way and bullshit on some papers and write some some papers and essays and stuff. So, so that, that's what I did. And and uh, of course, I I don't use my degree now at all. I'm doing the music thing, but you're but a maybe, songwriter. Yeah, maybe maybe there's some stuff there. Uh, you know, I, I took some poetry classes that might be that maybe helps a little bit. But I don't think po- poems from uh, 1700 Alfred Lord Tennyson really helped my songwriting ability <laughs> <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Well, I got mine in radio, so I'm happy to say that the second mortgage on my parents' house yeah. is was worth it. There you go. Yeah. There you go. That's great. <laughs> well, I want to talk about everything you got going on this year because you've got your new solo album coming out on May 3rd that's called Infinity mm-hmm. Now, which is, is it technically your second solo album because the first solo release was an EP? Is Are you calling it your sophomore release? So I had an EP about 10 years ago, and then I had an, another full length uh, a few, a couple years ago, 2021, called This World or the Next, and that was a full length. And so this is technically my second full length release, but I think, I think it kind of comes across as my first because like this is my first one like with a real partnership with a label like Rise Records and you know I've got a publicist now it's like wow I'm a real I'm a real person now so you know <laughs> kind of it kind of seems like it's my first one Oh you're so grown up now I know look at him go <laughs> <laughs> Was that solo album you released in 2021 a product of just being cooped up cuz of covid and just wanting to be creative cuz so much music has come out of the pandemic and the lockdown yeah absolutely i you know honestly i i wrote it and recorded it before covid and all that stuff happened before it all went down and i i actually had it mixed and mastered and ready to go but i just was kind of superstitious about it and i'm like i don't want to release this on 2020 because i feel like historically people are going to look back and be like god what a shit year so at the time i was like well i'll just release it in 2021 but then of course 2021 turned out to be shit also so i was like well i'm not waiting any longer so i'm just going to put this out but yeah but it was all pretty much written and recorded uh beforehand but you you hear about you you know some of the songs on there you retroactively kind of look back and you're like this totally fits you know i had a song called dream away dream away of a of a new life and just escaping you know, and you're just like, well, this really fits right now because I'm stuck in my house because of this stinking virus. But uh, but yeah, no, it, it was just coincidental. Every musician I know was so grateful for their instrument and for their creative ability during the lockdown because at least you had that, that you could kind of channel all of the uncertainty and the, the sadness, whatever it was, oh, yeah. kind of channel it into some music. Yeah, absolutely. You know, even though I had, uh, you know, my my personal solo album was kind of done, you know, there there was a lot of projects that kind of came through the, the pipe there uh, and that I was so grateful for, uh, you know, different writing things, you know, different projects to work on. Um, you know, we worked on the Love and Death album, which was uh, Head from Corn, his his kind of side project. He was that just was on the show point. a few weeks ago. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Oh, man. He's he's one of my favorite people. Just like just an, an incredible person, an incredible musician, incredible story. Uh, you know, the things he's he's gone through and experienced. I mean, it's just he it's just, just opened a, a treatment center up here in Massachusetts. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. I, I don't I don't doubt it at all. Yeah. I, just a master class of a human being uh, and just getting to work on uh, his you know project. I was introduced to him through uh, our other Breaking Benjamin guitar player, Jason Rao, uh, who had done some work previously on on uh, their first album. So um, yeah, I was introduced and you know kind of worked 
worked on that. And then the co-producer, Joe Rickard, he produced my first album, This This World or the Next. He was also a co-producer on that Love and Death album, that second one. And so it was really just a, 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 an amazing time. And I'm so thankful that I had that creative outlet to work on that. You know, there was various other things. That one, that was one. Um, you worked with Santa Sonia. You worked with Fuel. Yeah. You've worked with a bunch of artists. Yeah, trying to, you know, I, I think, uh, again, it's one of those things, um, you know, I, I want to make as much music as I can, whether it's Breaking Benjamin, mine, or or working with other, you know, talented people. I, I, uh, I, I just want to make as much music as I can while I'm alive on this earth. <laughs> As somebody that has zero musical ability, I left all of that behind in the high school band and my clarinet in high school. Um, and I can't write songs. I've tried. I have such admiration for people that have that ability. And luckily with what I do, I'm surrounded by them. But I'm really curious when you're a musician and you're in a really successful band like Breaking Benjamin, hmm. how do you decide that this song idea is not a breaking Benjamin song idea and that this is more of a solo thing. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a, that's a, a common question that I'm asked actually. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I think I look at it, um, you know, whatever I'm working on, I, I look at it a, a, as a, you know, a project by project basis. You know, I think that's one way I kind of, uh, differentiate, uh, and, and also, you know, look, Breaking Benjamin, they have a sound, you know, we have a sound, you know, I, I keep saying they, you know, I'm still, I still think of myself as one of the new guys, obviously, because the band was around long before I was, I was in the band, but 10 years, 10 years later, I still say that, but, <laughs> but yeah, we, we have a sound and, uh, and, you know, that's, that's something we kind of try not to stray too far a away from. I think the, the fans really kind of expect a certain kind of quality and sound there but but with, at the same time still kind of adapting to kind of some some new sounds new trends and stuff but um but yeah i i, I go into that thinking about that and keeping that in mind and, and plus my stuff is, is a little bit different i mean it's all it's all rock and roll uh but also just vocalists you know just vocally thinking um you know ben sounds like ben i sound like me you know whoever whoever whatever artist or band that uh, that i'm fortunate enough to work with like i said i'm I, i'm so just honored and grateful to be able to be playing music and, and to get to work with uh some amazing people that just you know really bring out the best in me also so but yeah i think about like kind of what what they want to sound like and how you know what they want to say and um you know that that really goes into it a lot i watched the video for your first single strings and it's it's weird for me watching you perform and not having a guitar on how weird <laughs> is it for you to sing and not play guitar and why don't you play guitar is it just too much i don't know what to do with my hands <laughs> uh, yeah. uh yeah no it's uh I, I you know i love i love playing guitar and and you know uh, someone kind of brought this to my attention too is you know you put the guitar down and, and almost you, you almost need the guitar as kind of like that extra shield of defense of of you know security while you're up there but you know i've i've always had a guitar i've always sang with a guitar and and i guess i'm thinking in terms of like a, a crowd and, and and a fan that would be in the audience you know am i giving my all as a front man uh as a potential front man as, you know just being a guitar guy and i feel like I'm not. So I'm like, look, I'm going to have some songs where I put the guitar down and I'm like, I like go and do the thing and run around. And I'm not just so married to one spot and I can walk around and get in people's face. And, you know, I want to I want to be able to utilize that aspect and, and kind of have that, you know, that that tool, if you will, from the, you know, the the Swiss Army knife to be able to use that. Um, so, you know, that's kind of what I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, I want to I want to be able to do all the things and, um, and and kind of scratch that itch a little bit also for the fans that are kind of like, man, I wish he would just be a front man and not just the guitar singer guy. Nothing to take away from that because I've done it my whole career, but I just want to be able to do both. And um, and plus, it's kind of nice to just sing my whole career. I've been guitar and sing. So it's it's amazing to just be like. Fuck that guitar! I'm just going <laughs> to sing. I don't have to play guitar, and I'm just going to, you know, concentrate on one thing. So it's pretty, it's pretty fun, and it's cool to kind of just go back and forth. 
puts a little added pressure on your guitar player when he knows you can do his job. I, you know, I just, I'm, I'm, I will never say that I'm like the best guitar player. You know, I, I, I look at guitar playing, uh, in, in, as far as me personally, I mean, I, I love guitar and I, I'm such a fan of like the amazing guitar players of, of history in the world who they just can shred and they can just do things that are just absolutely unbelievable. But for me, I use the guitar as, as, as a chip to get the guacamole to the mouth. It's kind of like <laughs> I'm using it to get my voice out there and to get my song out there. And, uh, but that being said, you know, I still love guitar and I still love, you know, to play riffs and breakdowns and all that stuff too. But, but I'm, but I'm very, I'm very song, uh, you know, oriented and thinking about that and, uh, forward. Is it lyric first, melody first or riff first when you start a song? Gosh. Um, it could be, it's really a it kind of, I, I kind of change it up. Uh, for a lot of these songs on my album, I had a title first. I, I would start, I, I kind of tried that exercise, you know, because I would do a lot of these sessions with uh, these different writers and different people, you know. Uh, you know, sometimes when you first start an album, you know, you're not really sure who your producer is going to be. And, uh, you know, your publishing company or your label, or in my case, the, my label this time around, they're like, hey, you know, are you interested in, in writing with different people? And I'm like, absolutely. I want to put my best foot forward. I want to utilize whatever resources I can this time around. So put me in the room with whoever you can. And they, they, they did. And I was just so lucky to be able to get in the room with some of these amazing, talented people. Uh, and, and, and so it's funny. It's a funny thing. It's like speed dating. You know, you go in, you're like, hi, nice to meet you. Let's write the most creative thing we've ever written. Okay, You're talking about cool. Nashville, right? The songwriting scene in Nashville. It, sure, people both, talk both, about it yeah. all the time. It's so crazy to me. Oh, yeah. Both Nashville and, and California. I mean, there was a lot of stuff I did out in California, stuff in Nashville. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, lots of those things, you know, I, I feel like, you know, you don't necessarily, if you have an idea to bring in, I at least want to have a concept, maybe a, a, a song title. And so I found myself doing that a lot. And, uh, you know, I'd walk in, I'd have a song that I'd had, you know, I have a song infinity, you know, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know, it's cool. Uh, so, it, and, and, you know, it, we we're able to kind of just like build backwards from a song, uh, from a song title and, or, you know, build it from that and then retroactively like, oh man, this makes sense. So it was a cool exercise, but I don't think there's any real right or wrong way. You know, if, if, you know, I've, I've come up with stuff here in the studio where I like I start with a, just a little piano thing and then maybe come up with a lyric or come up with a melody or you know it's 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 all the above all all the above different ways every time and you got to be willing to kind of have the ideas come at you like I talked to Zach Malloy like a month ago and we were talking about all the bands that he's written with and then I yeah. said something and he was like wait what did you just say and he grabbed his phone and took a note in his phone and put it back down again I was like does that mean I get a song credit if you use that quote? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, uh, yeah, he may, you may have, uh, written a song right there and didn't even know it. <laughs> oh, I'll know it when I send him the bill. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Invoice. Yeah. Make checks payable to Mistress Carrie. Thank you very much. Exactly. Going back to the early days of your guitar playing, um, who gave you the first one? Where did it come from? So I, my first guitar ever came from my oldest brother uh, for Christmas. I got a guitar for Christmas. But before that, I, I was borrowing a guitar from friends. And um, the first person that ever showed me how to play anything on a guitar uh, was my good friend Shane uh, growing up. And I'm still great friends with him today. And it's funny, I've known him since like first grade. So, you know, 40 years ago <laughs> or something. Uh, it's, it's wild to, to, to have known someone that long other than, you know, my, my, your family. And, uh, yeah, we would, we would just hang out in, in junior high and high school, you know, and I, I went over there one time to his house and he was playing guitar and I was just kind of like, dang, that's pretty cool. And, and, and then, you know, I was like, well, man, I'm, I want to kind of learn how to play. So then I would like, he let me borrow a guitar and then he would show me how to play a couple of Metallica songs. And, and it was like, boom, I was like this is awesome. And we were, we were just jamming together and we eventually started a band together. Uh, so that was kind of my first kind of, uh, you know, four way, four a into it. What was the band called? 
gosh, the first band I ever had was called Neptune. Nice. And it was like, it was like primarily, I think we had like one original, but we just played Pearl Jam and all kinds of covers and stuff. We were real into like King's X and uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty funny. And then, and then another band that, that eventually turned to a band called Copper and that was more original stuff. And I was, you know, I, I had that band in Knoxville, Tennessee for like eight years. Then I joined a band called Adelita's Way and then now Break of Benjamin and now Solo and Breaking Band. So do you still have that guitar that your brother gave you? Please tell me you still have it. Um, I don't. I'm not sure what happened to that guitar. It actually it might still be might still be up uh in my old house I grew up in uh in West Virginia. But uh but I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure. I, I can't can't remember. I do still have my first Maybe about a year later, um, I asked my parents for an electric guitar, and, and for Christmas the next year, they they got me my first electric guitar, and I do still have it, and it is just yeah, it's like old. It just it just smells like 1996. <laughs> <laughs> it's like dusty, but uh, but it still it still works. I need to kind of take it in somewhere and get it kind of fixed up a little bit. I have a theory about people's musical upbringing that there's the soundtrack to your childhood, the music that you have thrust upon you by your parents, your cool uncle, your older brother, neighbors, yeah. and then you discover something on your own and you go, I like that, and from then on it's different. So is that Metallica track you were playing with your friend Shane, the line in the sand, what was, what was the soundtrack to your childhood and then what was it that changed everything? Well, my dad, um, he was a singer, um, back in the day, back in, uh, in the sixties. And, and he, he was really into kind of like cr the crooner kind of music. Like he loved Frank Sinatra, you know, Perry Como, uh, you know, all those kind of singers like that. And, and so I, I heard a lot of Frank Sinatra and, and that kind of big band stuff growing up, which I love still to this day. Uh, I absolutely love it. Um, but then I had my brothers. I have two older brothers, 10 years and 17 years older than me. So they were in and out and gone by the time I was like growing up, but they left behind, uh, you know, mementos. And, and a couple of things they left behind were some cassette tapes and kind of just, you know, cassette tapes that they made. I remember I had one, one side of it was Elton John and the other side of it was, was Journey, uh, the, the Escape album. Oh, and then there so was another good. tape that was, that was Boston. And, and so, I rocked those tapes. Like I had, a, I got a Walkman for, you know, my birthday or something. And I just listened to those tapes over and over. So, and I loved it. And so to this day, I love journey. I love Boston and I love Elton John. And then Metallica came later. And then it was just Alice in Chains. And then it was Stunt of a Pilots and Soundgarden tool, you know, but then I also remember, you know, in those eighties, those form, you know, formative eighties growing up years, you know, I, I'd, I'd have to like wake my brother up to go to high school. And one of the ways I would do it, I was turn his stereo on. And so his stereo would come on and be like the local, you know, pop radio station. And it was like all the stuff we think of as like classic 80s. But at the time, it's like, here's today's hit. You know, it's like Tears for Fears, you know, shout and, and you know, all the 80s, you know, the police, Phil Collins and all that kind of stuff that I love also because it just really just like, man, I, this, I remember hearing this when I was like, you know, six years old, seven years old. So it's, I'm all over the place. <laughs> I mean, I really am. So it's, it's hard to say uh, what I've really kind of gravitated to because I, I feel like I try to, you know, pull from everything to, to uh, write my music and really kind of utilize everything that, that I love that I want to hear in uh, some of my music. But it's all still rock and roll. I, I still kind of, you know, base it uh, around that. When I talk to guitar players, I ask them about tone because it's such a personal thing. Where do yeah. you think guitar tone comes from? Well, I would say most guitar players would say that it comes from uh, the hands uh, and the fingers. You know, a lot of people say like, yeah, but, you know, you need a great amp. But I've seen I've seen examples of both. I've I've seen an absolutely amazing guitar player play through the tiniest little piece of crap amp and make it absolutely sing with incredible tone and just like 
touch and feel and everything just like amazing. Uh, and, but then, you know, I've seen also someone that's not that great, uh, on guitar, uh, still make a power chord sound good through a great amp, but that's about it. <laughs> that's about all they could make sound great. So I think it's a combination, you know, if you have a great sound and amp and you have someone that can really play and really know how to manipulate it with their hands, uh, it's, that's a combo that's pretty tough to beat. If you could swoop in and steal somebody's tone, whose tone would you steal? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> well, see, here's the thing. I would have to steal their hands, too. <laughs> because, yeah, I, you know, I think... Uh, whose hands are you stealing, then? Yeah, it's like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? What comes first, the hands or the amp that can play it? Or the, the hands that can play it, yeah. Uh, you know who's got great tone is Jerry Cantrell. Man. That guy and, and man can his his hands and fingers make that thing sing. And I've seen it firsthand. We did a, a tour with them uh, last summer. And uh, and for a hot second there, I, I, I made friends with his guitar tech. And and he was like one day I walked in, he was testing Jerry's amp, you know, through his guitar. And he was just like, hey, you want to play through this for a second? I was like, yes, absolutely. I would. And he handed me his guitar and I just like played a chord and it was you know through the whole thing and it was jerry's you know rig and man it was so awesome and i had somebody i had somebody record it so so i just had documentation i'll never post it or anything but, <laughs> no it's just it's personal for, for you oh absolutely it's absolutely just like oh you know so it's just so good um but yeah i'd probably yeah his uh, you know I wouldn't want to steal it because I, I want him to stay the same and, and be the musical genius that he continues to be. But maybe just, you know, give me a lesson and maybe, maybe let me borrow some stuff. <laughs> I got sent on this whole trajectory because during the aforementioned pandemic, I had like a three hour conversation with a very locked down Nuno Betancourt. And oh, he wow. told me the story about how Dweezil Zappa introduced him to Eddie Van Halen because he grew up idolizing him, right? Yeah. And that he took him to a Van Halen rehearsal and he met oh, wow. Eddie and Eddie let him play through his rig, guitar, yeah. strings, cables, amps, pedals, all of it. And he goes, I was so disappointed because I thought it was going to be the one time I sounded like Eddie Van Halen and I uh -huh. still sounded like me. So it goes wow. back to the whole thing you're talking about. Yeah. It be in the hands. Yeah. He was like, I was yeah. so disappointed. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. And that is, that is, you know, Eddie Van Halen, the greatest, you know, I mean, just absolute visionary genius, just one and only, you know? And so I, I totally get that. I totally understand. Um, and plus I, you know, he had his amps turned up so loud and so just cranked. You know, so if you're not manipulating, you know how to do that just like he does. You know, it's just it's just out of control sounding. So, yeah. The difference between being a musician and being a songwriter are two very different things. So if you're shredding Metallica on that borrowed guitar, when did you realize you could write songs? Well, here's the thing. I, I, I think it's all about what you put your time into. I realized it at an early age, you know, I don't know if I want to invest my time in, in learning how to be a, a quote unquote shredder. Uh, but that being said, there are people that can shred and absolutely write a song. You know, they, they can do both. I, I didn't feel like I had enough time <laughs> to learn both. <laughs> so uh, I just was like, you know what, I really want to be able to like, write a song that that can make somebody cry or make somebody feel something and or make somebody feel uh good you know and and give them hope you know so i really wanted to kind of uh focus on that and, and work on that uh specific part of the craft so uh and that being said you know and, and being able to sing it and, and really communicate that so i think i really try to 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 learn and focus on that more than anything um, is the songwriting part. And unfortunately, you can't just, I mean, I'm sure there are people that just come out of the womb and they're like, I can write a song and here's a song and it sounds great, but I was not one of those ones. I, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a muscle that, that you just have to keep doing. I've written so many awful songs in my life and I'm sure I've got more awful songs in me. They're just dying to come out. But every once in a while, 
you, you, you want to hope that you, you write something that's, that's pretty cool and, and other people will like. And the more times you do it, uh, the more chances you have of, of uh, writing something cool. So, so I don't know. I, I still, I'm still working at that, working at that. It's, uh, I'm constantly a, a student and, and a practitioner of, of, of songwriting. So, you know, I want to hope that, uh, you know, I just keep getting better and better and keep learning. Do you remember the first song you ever wrote? Um, <laughs> I think I, I think I've 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 washed it away from my memory because <laughs> it's too it's too bad. I, th- <laughs> I I do remember I do remember writing a song that I like recorded and I had it on like a cassette tape and it was just so awful. I I can rem- I can remember t- I can remember it a little bit, but. Uh, I'm sure maybe I had something before that, but that's the first one I remember where I had like a title. And so, yeah. I think it's so funny for people of our generation that had those little like toy cassette recorders because it's almost like you could pinpoint the kids that were going to end up doing what you and I do because we all had those toy cassette recorders and you were putting songs on them. And I was walking around with a microphone, (laughs) like talking about whatever was going on in my life. And now look at us all these years later. Oh, that's so funny. And I, I had, I had that one year too. It was like a, a, a cassette player about this big and it had a little red microphone. It was like this colorful looking thing. And it had a little red microphone and I remember I'd be recording stuff and singing stuff and I would interview people I, like I'd be like, hey, I, I remember there was one tape. I, I wish I had the tape still. The I know I gone. can't find any of mine either. And my mom was one of those moms that saved everything and I can't yeah. find my old tapes. Yeah, I, I just I just remember interviewing like my older cousin and just being like, hey, well, tell me what you think of me. And then, <laughs> <laughs> just like being that annoying little kid with a microphone. I'm like, God, that's hell. I always was really curious what adults talked about when they kicked us out of the room when we were kids. So I took that cassette player and I taped the microphone into a house plant and and bugged the room (laughs) so that I could go back and listen to it later. And I watched the clock and I'm such an idiot that I went in to flip the cassette over and I got caught. (laughs) Wow. That's that's a that's an incredible idea. Wow, that's that's pretty funny. I wanted to know what they were talking about that they wouldn't let us hear. Yeah, I oh, needed yeah, totally. to know. Totally. Did now now did you you got caught and they took the tape and that was it? You didn't hear you didn't hear any. I of the never found the out. They were. <laughs> I don't know if they had the nuclear codes. I don't know what they were talking <laughs> about, but I never found out what they were talking about. Wow, what an idea! Uh, that's pretty good. That now you can just leave your iPhone in the room and walk out. Kids have it so easy these days. Oh my gosh, it's it's wild. Yeah, so much so much technology. Is that where you store your song ideas? Every artist that I talk to is like, yeah, I got a thing in my notes on my phone. You know, sometimes I uh, I'll, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and just you know record something. But more often times than not, when I go back to review um, an idea. It's so just out of context that I'm just like, this sounds like just like awful mumbles of crap, you know? So I'm just like, I'm, I don't get it. Like when I go back to review, I'm like, this sucks. So I end up not using anything. So I find that um, I guess I get my ideas best when I'm actually just like sitting in front of the computer with Pro Tools and I'm actually really recording something. Jerry Cantrell actually told me he sings riff ideas into his phone. So if you were ever to steal his phone, you can only imagine the wealth of riff ideas that lives in that phone. Oh, wow. Yeah, I bet. And yeah, the, you know, what's funny, I, I, I had, a, you know, I, when we toured with him, I actually uh, got to play a round of golf uh, with, with Jerry and uh, a, a couple other peeps. I think Corey from Bush was out with us, too. And uh, that would have been an opportunity to uh, <laughs> steal the phone. Wow. While, while he's swinging away, I'm just like, okay, I'm going to listen to some of these ideas. Uh, no, but it was an unforgettable experience. I mean, I'm, I'm such a fan of them and, and, and being able to just do something like that, like on a day off was just like crazy to me. Uh, talk about nerve wracking too. You know, golf's already hard as hell to play. 
Uh, but when you have like one of your, you know, musical heroes behind you, like watching your, watching you swing, it's, uh, it's, it's puts a new uh, element of difficulty there. I'm always shocked at how many rock stars play golf because it's not something I have any interest in learning how to do at all. And it seems so, maybe it is because it's so opposite of what you do that you're kind of outside and you're, it's quiet and yeah. You get to drive the yeah. funny little car. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really nice. Uh, sometimes I will say if you're playing good, uh, it's not too bad. If you're playing like shit, then it's, <laughs> it's a, it's a walk spoiled as, as Mark Twain would say. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's fun. You know, you do, you said it, you, you absolutely said it, you know, you're outside in nature. You're like, oh man, this is beautiful. You know, you're, you're usually with some buds, you know, it's a, it's a, it's something to, you know, kind of get your mind off the, the world for a while. And, uh, and plus, you know, it's nothing too crazy physical, like basketball or something where there's just like, you know, dang, I'm, I might have a heart attack doing this. Uh, I mean, you still might with golf, but I think the chances are diminished a little bit. Yeah, and you're not going to get hurt and get your tour canceled. Yeah, that too. That too. Yeah, although, I mean, there is there is a chance of, you know, throwing your back out. But, of course, you know, I, I'll go to bed sometimes and I'll wake up hurt with something. <laughs> I'm, I'm at that age now where you just wake up and you're like, what the hell did I do? <laughs> you know, I was sleeping. I do want to point out, by the way, that you just used your English degree because you quoted Mark Twain, and I got it on tape. <laughs> Gosh. Well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of when I actually met you um, because my old radio station, WAF in Boston, played the hell out of Adelita Sway. So I was like, maybe it was then, or maybe it was Breaking Benjamin. I saw you guys play at the big gig last year in Worcester. Sold out arena show. Like you guys ran by me on your way to the stage. And then I didn't see you after the show. So I was trying to figure out like when the last time I actually got to sit down with you was, it was a long time ago. Gosh, I, I don't know. I, uh, yeah. And, and, and with Adelita's way, it's kind of like, you know, they're still playing there's So it would have to fall in a four year range in there. I'm like, OK, yep, I was there for that. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is one of those things where it's like, OK, wait, was I there? What year was it? What the hell was going on? What town was I in? Yeah. Yeah. I can also tell like Facebook, you know, those memories will come up. Here's a memory from, and I'm just like, oh, that's 2011. I can tell by what stupid shirt I've got on and what stupid hairstyle I've got going on. So yeah, always some signals. I have to ask you the songwriting question that I ask every guest. So this is not a favorite song or a favorite artist question. It's a craft question. Can you give okay. me an example of a song that you think is perfectly crafted? Any artist, any genre, that doesn't matter. But break it down as to why you think it's so brilliantly written. Like a song you think is so well written that you wish you wrote it yourself. Gosh, there's so many. There there are so many. Uh, whew, gosh. Um, my favorite song of all time uh, is In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins. I think that song's just, every time I hear it, I'm just like, man, it's just... It's just good. Um, so many Billy Joel songs. I mean, Always a Woman is an incredible song. Piano Man is an incredible song. Uh, got Bridge Over Troubled Water by Simon and Garf Garfunkel is an incredible song that I wish I wrote. I mean, just absolute genius. Uh, there's just so many. I mean, there's there's a few right there. It's all, all old school mainly. I guess uh, I, I should probably give like a newer example. Um, no, those are some pretty classics. Yeah. All right. Cool. Have you seen those I'm reaction those. videos of, of like hip hop kids listening to Phil Collins when the drums kick in and they're like, Whoa, like there's all no, these, Oh, you got to look on YouTube. There are so <laughs> many of these reaction videos of people listening to music that they never heard in their lives for the first time, like really famous songs. And the Phil Collins one, when the drums kick in is hilarious every single time. <laughs> That's amazing. Gosh, I'd like to see a reaction video of me doing it. Just cause <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd freak out still too. <laughs> it's probably one of the most famous like drum riffs ever. If, if that's what you call it, a drum riff, but like, yeah. is there a more famous drum lick? 
in rock and roll? The whole song's built around that one part. Yeah, I can't I can't think of any. I mean, that's pretty iconic. Well, the new album is called Infinity Now. It comes out on May 3rd. You announced the tour dates, and we've got two in New England. You're going to be at the Webster in Hartford on July 21st, and you're going to be at the Paradise Rock Club in Boston on July 22nd. Amazing. So we're going to see wait. you a couple times. Yeah, I can't wait. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Just announced uh, that tour yesterday, and... Uh, Man, I think that's that's one of the things that I, I've really been focused on uh, with this release. Um, it, it's 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 just getting people to know that I exist. You know, it's it's it really is it really is a hard thing. You you would think that uh, you know I've done some tours with with Breaking Ben where I'm I'm opening and I'm opening the show and and I did an interesting experiment where I would ask the crowd. I would be like, Has anyone ever heard of me? And some people be like, yeah, yeah, no. who has never heard of me in their life? You know, who's never heard of Keith Wallen? And, and I'd be in a Breaking Benjamin full crowd and, and so many people be like, yeah, I've never heard of you. And I'm like, well, I've been playing for guitar for Breaking Band for the last 10 years. And everybody and, in the crowd's like, shit. Yeah, well, well, here's the thing. I, I came to realize that, you know, not everybody's going to know every band member from every band and not and, and even less people are going to know that that band member has music of his own. So I think it's just it's it's kind of, you know, naive to just assume that everyone should know. So that's my thing. I, I've got to let no pe let people know that that I exist and I, in fact, make music. And yes, I'm also in Breaking Benjamin, but I'm also, you know, this is my my other plan. A I have two plan A's. Uh, they're equally important to me. And so that's the thing, you know, got to get the word out, got to get the exposure. And and, uh, and I can't thank you enough for, for having me and, and giving me your amazing platform to, to talk about myself. Oh, no, I'm excited know. that you wanted to come on. And, you know, when we started talking, we talked about the hectic 2024. So you're talking about your solo tour, but mm -hmm. it deserves mentioning that all of the biggest rock festivals in the United States Breaking Benjamin is playing them all. You're playing Rockville, Sonic Temple, Louder Than Life, Incarceration, and Aftershock. Breaking Benjamin's got you pretty busy this year too. Those shows are massive. Yeah, those are those those shows are always just uh, an incredible treat to be a part of. Um, it's it's amazing every time. Uh, you know, we've we've had just a really, really great time. Every time we play one of the, the Danny Wimmer festivals, uh, always, always an amazing time. And, uh, yeah, to, this is, this is our year to, to get out there and play those. I, I can't wait until, uh, I mean, I hope this day comes that eventually I can play them as a solo artist with my solo band. I'm, I'm hopefully I'm going to try to work up to that level. Uh, but, uh, I've definitely, I'm definitely, uh, looking forward to this, this spring and this summer and playing those shows for sure. You are going to be a very busy man, Keith. I appreciate you taking the time to hang out with me today. Congratulations on the release of your big solo album and obviously all of the successes that are coming with Breaking Benjamin. It's 2024. is You're making up for all the time. You couldn't leave the basement during the pandemic this year. <laughs> you're telling me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, my album comes out May 3rd. And uh, anybody that's interested in following me on any other thing, at KJ Wallen is my Instagram, it's my Twitter, it's my TikTok. All, all the, the links are are linked all in the show notes of the episode with the tour dates Perfect. and the links to get tickets. I got your back, Keith. Don't worry ah, about it. You're the best. I took of care of do. all of the clickable links for you. And we always make a corresponding playlist for every episode that's linked in the show notes. That's cool. got all of your music and all of the songs and the artists that we talked about too. So this is going to be a good wow. playlist with all the stuff we talked about. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. You got it. You it's got it done. going on. This is a professional outfit around here. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm so programmed <laughs> again. Again, I'm just like, people don't know you exist, Keith. They don't know you exist. I'm like, okay, okay. You wouldn't have made it on the show if nobody knew you existed. Come on, Keith. Don't you sell yourself I'm, short. I'm a real person. You yes. are. You're good <laughs> enough and Gosh darn it, people like me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'll see you soon. Thank you so much. We'll see you when you get to Boston. I can't wait. Thank you so much. There he is, the very real person, Keith Wallen from Breaking Benjamin. 
His new solo album, Infinity Now, is coming out on May 3rd. The solo tour stops in Hartford, Connecticut at the Webster Theater on July 21st and at the Paradise Rock Club in Boston on July 22nd. And if you want to see him do his day job with Breaking Benjamin, September 18th at the Bank of New Hampshire Pavilion, you can see Stained and Breaking Benjamin with Daughtry and Lakeside. You'll get the links to all of those shows in the show notes of this episode. You'll also find the link to this episode's corresponding playlist, which features a bunch of Keith's new music, Breaking Benjamin, and all of the songs and artists that we talked about in the interview. You'll also find all of Keith's links, all the Breaking Benjamin links, and all the Mistress Carrie links too. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to the Mistress Carrie podcast. New full-length episodes come out every Wednesday, plus every weekday you get the sit rep, which breaks down all of the rock news, music headlines, and entertainment updates to around five minutes. Join me live every Tuesday night on my official Facebook page, YouTube channel, and Instagram for my weekly video show, Cocktails in the War Room. And you can always catch me on the radio. Get the details on all that and more at mistresscarry.com. The Mistress Carrie Podcast, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network.